Alright, in this series we'll be looking at vectors and the first question, as the title of our video suggests, is what is a vector? But before we head into that, I want you to imagine you're at some kind of social event. If you're uh, not like me, you might not need to use your imagination that much for that, but pretend that this is me and someone comes up and a question we normally ask is uh, what do you do during the week what do you what do you do and so I might say oh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher and um, we might make a conversation or have some stories about what that involves and um, so on and so forth that's probably not what happens for you in your situation right I don't think it works this way I don't think someone would come up and be like, hey, what do you do during the week? And you'd be like, I'm a student. And they'd be like, me too, what a coincidence. I don't think it works that way, right? Because it would seem that being a student isn't the most meaningful thing for someone uh, in your context, well, everyone is, right? What's more important is maybe you ask a question like, you know, what school do you go to? What's that like for you? And, and it's more about uh, what space you live and work in rather than just your identity there. Okay, now hold on to that thought as we ask this question, uh, what is a vector? Because to call something a vector in maths is a bit like calling yourself a student. I guess it is somewhat meaningful, but that meaning is only fully developed when you look further into what space you're living and working inside. Okay, so in our course, we will often write our vectors like this. Um, I'll tell you why later. A couple of numbers stacked on top of each other in brackets, and so this would be the vector 2, 1. Okay, don't say 2 over 1, that's like a fraction, but this is just the vector 2, 1 over here. Okay, for us, it will mean this. We uh, go to a coordinate axis, um, and we draw an arrow. That means to move two steps to the right and one step up. Okay, so this arrow over here. Okay, but this vector could live in another space, so to speak, right? Let's take the space of all parabolas passing through the origin, because why not? Um, and then, right, 2, 1 might actually mean the parabola with equation 2x plus 1x squared, right? Or if this vector lived in the space of uh, all waves that bounced at a particular frequency, it could mean getting a sine wave of amplitude 2 and a cosine wave of amplitude 1 and adding them together like this, right? Now, so see what I mean? Vectors can take all sorts of different shapes and sizes and types, and I've only shown you three examples, but there's heaps and heaps and heaps of different types of vectors we could be talking about. Okay, now what's interesting is the structure governing each of these environments, these different spaces that the vectors can live and interact in, right? And so maybe we should instead ask the question, what is a vector space? Uh, what governs, what sort of structures and rules govern these, uh, these environments and how are they similar to each other? Right, there are heaps of technicalities here, there's actually eight in fact, uh, but I won't get into all of that as it's a bit beyond what you need to know, uh, but I'll try and capture the main essence of those ideas here. Okay, a vector space is essentially an environment where objects can be combined together, and we call this addition. And they can also be scaled in some way. I like to think of scaling as some kind of stretching thing. Uh, it might not be obvious what this means yet, but we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Okay, let's start with the addition, right? When we combine two vectors together. So say I wanna add the vector to one with another vector like uh, one three. Okay, now arrow picture, the vector one three is this green arrow that moves one step to the right and three steps up. Right, so this, this arrow over here. Uh, to add it on to the blue vector, right, we could literally stick the green one to the end of the blue one and look at how far we've traveled in total, okay? Because the arrows just represent movement. So we can look at how far we've moved in total, which is essentially to have traveled along the pink vector. Right, the pink one just goes directly there. Uh, the blue and the green are like taking a detour. All right, but when you combine the blue and green arrows, the result is that pink arrow. Now the blue vector takes you two steps to the right and one step up. The green vector takes you one step to the right and three steps up. So when we've traveled both of them, 
we would have gone three steps across in total and four steps up in total. And so the pink vector must be the vector 3, 4. Now, just looking at that equation, you can sort of see that it's kind of it's kind of obvious when we've stacked those numbers on top of each other, the notation really clearly indicates what is going on, right? 2 plus 1 is 3, and 1 plus 3 is 4, okay? But it's important to see what is geometrically happening to uh, when we say that. Okay. Now, there's a couple of other really important things to note here. One is, uh, notice we were quite free to sort of move our vectors around. Okay, Generally, at our level and in our context, vectors can sort of start anywhere, so long as they carry the same movement. So both of those green arrows are equally the vector 1, 3, because they both are arrows representing moving one across and three up. Okay, so as long as the arrow moves the same distance in the same direction, it's it's the same, okay? And that's why we could just stick the green vector to the end of the blue one to visualize combining them like that, that addition, okay? All right, one more thing before we move on. Uh, we could, of course, have added them the other way and we'd expect to get the same answer. So we could have stuck the blue vector onto the end of the green one instead and would of course get the same result. So actually adding two vectors in this space, if you look at what shape we've created there, it naturally produces uh, the structure of parallelograms. And we'll see towards the end of the topic that this idea can be used as a really powerful tool to actually prove a lot of things about you know, parallelograms and you know, rhombuses and other geometric things that might be quite difficult to prove otherwise. Okay, but this sort of combining or adding could be done for other vector spaces on the side as well. So um, say for the quadratics on the left, the vector 1, 3 could well represent the parabola with equation uh, 1x plus 3x squared. All right, then addition can be done in the usual sense, and it gives you 3x plus 4x squared. Okay, that's adding vectors as well, right? Uh, likewise, for the waves on the right, the vector 1, 3 could represent some sine wave with amplitude 1 and a cosine wave with amplitude 3, giving you this beast. And then we could add the blue and green waves to give you that pink one there. Okay, that's actually how all sound is produced. It's, it's just a combination of different frequencies. And uh, look, I won't get into that now, but it's quite interesting. Okay. All right, so that's the first thing you can do in all types of vectors in all vector spaces. There's always a sense in which you can add vectors together. Okay. All right, so return to our original vector to one here. All right. The other thing that we can do to vectors uh, is to scale them. Right. And again, what I like to think of is sort of a stretching a vector or multiplying the vector by a number. So say this orange 2 here. This would have the effect of stretching the blue arrow to double its length without changing which way it points. Okay, so since the original blue vector takes you two steps across and one step up, you just double that movement, which means the orange arrow must be four steps to the right and two steps up. And so the orange vector must be 4, 2. Okay, once again, if you just look at the equation, I hope it's numerically quite obvious, right? That uh, 2 times 2 is 4, and 2 times 1 is, is 2. Uh, but again, I think it's important to be able to picture what's happening uh, when you multiply like this. And this time, the really, really important thing to note is that when we scale vectors by multiplying them uh, with a number, okay, it's got to be a number. It's not another vector. Okay, you don't multiply two vectors like that. It's always multiplying a vector by a number to scale them. Uh, actually, because of this, we sometimes actually refer to plain normal numbers as scalars, because that's what they do, right? When you multiply a vector by a number, it scales it. Okay, so there are ways of defining products between vectors, but we'll talk about that later. It's got to be really carefully done. But for now, again, we're scaling by multiplying numbers. Okay, so what might this look like in different vector spaces? Well, for the quadratics on the left, it would just be to algebraically multiply everything by 2, so in brackets like that. And our usual expansion would just give us 4x plus 2x squared. 
all right? And for the world on the right, that vector space of waves on the right there, it would just be stretching the amplitude, okay? Something like that. All right, now for the rest of this topic, don't be scared about all these different spaces. For the rest of this topic, we'll pretty much look exclusively at the vector space of those arrows in the middle there. Okay, I might have noticed I've spent most of my time talking about those ones. Uh, but do keep in mind, right, that these structures of being able to add and to scale, right, that structure uh, would apply in other contexts as well. And recognizing these structures when you do things like differential equations or recurrence equations or even solutions to uh, simple harmonic motion problems, um, it'll help make sense of a lot of things you'll come across later if this idea of a vector space structure is still somewhere in your head, okay? All right, but let's recap and focus back on the arrows. This is the part we actually have to know in our course. Uh, we can think of each vector like two, one as a combination of horizontal and vertical movements. So this would be the arrow taking you two steps to the right and one step up. Okay, then two things can happen inside a vector space. Uh, first, you can say add the blue vector with another vector, like our green one three guy, by sticking one of them to the end of the other one and seeing where that takes you in total. Okay, where have you traveled? If you travel along both vectors, it's like the same as traveling along that pink one here. And so the pink one is the sum of those two blue and green vectors. Numerically, it's really easy. We just add each component. So 2 plus 1 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. It doesn't matter which way you do it, of course. And if you do it the other way, you form a parallelogram, okay? Which is something we're going to use a lot to prove geometry stuff further down the track. Okay, then the second thing was you can scale a vector by multiplying it with a number. Not another vector, but a number. This just stretches the length of the vector without changing its direction. Look, unless you multiply it by a negative, at which point it flips around. Um, but then stretching by two doubles the length and it becomes the orange vector there. Okay, numerically, it's just multiplying each component. So two times two is four, two times one is two. And again, if you're scaling by a negative, it might flip the direction, but it really still can be thought of as the same direction you're just walking backwards okay we can think a bit like that in math sometimes okay so that's all for this one thanks for watching i'll see you around